the company of the prophet said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, where each of us can get a pole, and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? And will Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? Then he showed him the place. Elisha cut his stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. It's good to be with you this morning. So uh, my name is Paul, for those of you who are new. And so we're going to jump in on this. So we, I kind of set this teaching theme about ridiculous, and it's looking at the story of Elisha. Now, if you look at the story of Elisha, like there's, there's just like loads of miracles um, that God uses them for. And, and that, like some of them are a bit crazy. And, and, oh, like, so when we use the word ridiculous... It's not like uh, we use it in a positive, do you know what I mean? Like some people might use the word ridiculous in a negative sense, yeah? But if you're, but if you're with your friends, you know, you're like, oh, that's ridiculous, you know, you use it in a positive sense. Okay, that's crazy in a, in a positive way, in an exciting way. So when we look at those, th- um, those different themes and it's kind of like ridiculous, it's not like, oh, that's so ridiculous, I, I can't even believe that happened. It's like, that's so ridiculous, I can't believe that God did that. That God stepped in, and 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 there's this, and here is this like little story uh, in in this passage of, of Elisha, which is it's not as significant or like mind blowing, but it's I love it, and um I I bought this jumper just almost a year ago, and on the back it says love, peace, and randomness, okay, and um and that, I've, I kind of feel like that summarizes my life a little bit, uh, particularly more the randomness bit. And I'm working on the love and the peace bit. But the idea of, like, there's something about this story that feels quite random. Like, you know, when you read the story of Elisha, you can easily just kind of, like, read over it. um, Because it's not as significant or as powerful as the other ones. But I love it. I love how, you know, it's just very kind of small and simple. But but the other story is where Elisha kind of raises uh, the widow's son from the dead. Which is crazy, right? And then the other story of bringing fire down from heaven, and you know, the, you know these are kind of the, the stories that we'll make a film about. But an axe head floating to the top of the water is not really going to be a Disney film anytime soon, right? But I love it. I love how uh, I love it so much because what it reveals is how God moves in in what seems to sometimes be insignificant ways to everyone else. But to that one person, it was so significant. That's what I love about this story. And that's what encourages me because it reveals that God cares about me as an individual. He cares about my life and my concerns. And this should encourage all of you as individuals that God cares about your life about what's going on and about what you're concerned about and the issues that you're facing. God does concern. And if we call out to him, he intervenes into our lives. And and so whatever is causing concern and anxiety, he, he responds to that. And so I love this story. So let's look at it in a bit more detail. So the context of this, as mentioned the last time I spoke, is that every area in the, in the land that is under Israel uh, control okay, has, has a school of the prophetic, okay, as, as well as a school of the priesthood. And so Elisha is the head, is it like the bishop of the school of the, of the prophetic, and whose role it was to represent God to the people, which is the difference between the the role of the priest and and the prophet is that the priest would represent the people to God. So the the priest would take the concerns and the prayers and present them to God. The role of the prophet 
was to hear from God and be the voice of God to the people. Okay, that's the, that's, that was the distinct difference. And so Elijah and, and now Elisha were known as men who truly carried the message of God. And the miracles that they performed were all signs of God's love and revealed that God cared for his people and could be trusted. And because of that, people wanted to follow them. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? I mean, if you saw somebody raise somebody from the dead, if you saw someone call fire down from above, if you, if you saw these things, like you would want to hang out with them, wouldn't you? I mean, if you, if you had Elisha down at the other church this morning and, and you had me here this morning, you'd go, Paul, no disrespect, mate, but I'm going to go and hear from Elisha. I want to go and see what he's doing. And I'm like, forget it, I'm coming with you. Like, I want to hang out where, where God is at work and where God is doing the miraculous, right? I want to see that. And, and, and the world longs to see that. Because in doing so, like they, they will, this God is real. And he can be trusted. And he performs miracles and signs and wonders. And it's so people wanted to follow them. And so there's this school that's kind of growing and developing. But for me, it's a reminder to the church that when people t- truly see the message of God's love, and see the outworking of this through his people, that they will want to come and follow. A year ago, around this time, a year ago, in Asbury University in Kentucky, did anyone hear there was, uh, there was a kind of a, a, a mini revival renewal going on? Did you hear about this? So all the students um, in that university, they just, like, like they did every day, would get up and have a time of worship and prayer in chapel. You know, they'd, they'd come essentially to a, like, a mini church service and normally at the end they would then go off to their lessons. But on this time, in, on the 8th of February, they, they gathered to pray and to worship and the Spirit of God moved. And they didn't stop the meeting. The meeting went on for weeks and weeks. And, and then what happened is that, that people from all over the world started descending on this small little university in Kentucky. And they reckon that over a period of 12, 12 days, they had over 100,000 people visit that chapel. There was even a couple in Peru who sold their two cars in order that they could travel from Peru to go to Kentucky because they were so longing to experience something of the presence of God. So people were sacrificing their possessions and they were queuing for hours, like there were queues going all the way down the street, queuing for hours just to come into a chapel and to pray and to worship. And so many stories, so many testimonies came out of people being healed, people being restored, renewed, new people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But I'd, I'd, I mean, I don't know why I didn't go. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I wanted to go. But I want to see, I want to see that there. And to be honest, the Spirit of God who was at work there and this continues to be at work is the same Spirit of God who is at work here. Is he not? Is he any different? And so sometimes the question is, what was the difference? And sometimes the Spirit of God breaks out in ways and in places. But when you look at, at revival or in your movements, it always starts with a hunger in the people of God who, who come with a desperation and a desire to, to, to cry out for God, saying that things that are happening in our society, in the world, what and I, is not how I want it to be. And not how I think God wants it to be. And so they go, I'm going to push in, I'm going to pray, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to stop praying until I see the Spirit of God move. Because we know, do we not, that it's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit that transformation comes. Amen? Amen. And yet how often do we as the church get caught in trying in our own strength and doing things in our, in our own ways? Longing that somewhere along the line God will join us in our activity. Or we get busy, or we get tired, or we go, I mean, or all these other things. But sometimes it's just about, about coming to seek God for who He truly is. A hunger and a desire and a passion for Him. And that's almost why we need to focus more on, not focus more, but how do we create more space 
uh, to, to kind of push into the prophetic in churches. See, often as churches, we look for the priestly role. We look for the priest or the pastor, the one who presents our needs to God. But maybe we need more time for the prophetic where, where somebody hears from God and brings that to us. Or, you know what? You can hear from God. And even in your prayers, how much of your prayer is actually presenting your stuff, your issues, your concerns to God? As opposed to seeking and listening to hear from God. And if you spend more time listening from God, what is he saying? And then how are you responding differently to that? Or in accordance to that? Are you with me? And because sometimes I confess, my prayer life is often like, I come with my, God, you need to know this, what's going on in my life, you need to go, God, I'm not happy about this situation, I'm not happy about this situation, I'm not happy with that person, they're annoying me, I'm not happy that I've got enough money in the bank, I've got an issue with this or that or that. You know, we've all got all these different issues. Haven't we? Like, and they're real, and, they're, and, and that's fine, it's okay. But guess what? God knows. Do you think that he didn't know until you tell him? Don't get me wrong, he wants us to cry out to him and present these issues to him. But then he also wants us to listen and say, this is what we're going to do. And then we respond to that. And I think we need that more in the church today. So my prayer for us is that there will be more of a spiritual hunger for us to pursue the things of God and then and do so we'll go deeper. So let's come back to the story. So the community of prophets is growing. You know, there's more and more people going, hey, I want to become a prophet because that looks pretty amazing. I want to, I want to dabble in some of those miracle things. So, so people are, are joining the, the school of the prophetic and you see that here. So they're growing and, and all these people are like, okay, we're out here, but um, can we build a little shelter for ourselves because, you know, now and again it gets a bit cold and there's a bit of rain. So they, so they say to Elisha, look, can we, can we just go? Do you mind if we quickly go and get some wood and, and build a little shelter for ourselves? And so Elisha says, yeah, sure, off you go. So off they go and they, go, they grab some logs and they, I'll make bars and axe and he starts chopping and then the axe head falls off in the water. And there's this kind of this moment of anxiety and concern that falls on the man. Have, have you ever had that moment where you've borrowed something from someone and, you've, and, you, and then you've, like, you've lost it or you've forgotten it? Have you ever had that, a moment like that? You know, and you're just like, oh no, what am I going to do? And you weigh up your options, right? Oh, maybe if I just, maybe I just, let's just not mention it ever again and hopefully they might forget that I ever borrowed it. Or, or maybe kind of, you, do you run through this or is this just me? This is my own confession. Or maybe I put a little tail. Or, you know, he's like, oh, I don't know. Rather than say you've lost it, I'm like, oh, I don't know, I've lost it. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Let me have a look for it. Hoping that they may forget. I don't know, we go for all these different scenarios of what we could do. And maybe that's what he's doing. He's like, how am I going to tell this person that I've lost a lot of this axe head? You know, and so there's this anxiety that comes upon him. And so he's concerned and he calls to Elisha. And, and, and again, I just love, I just, I just want to see these stories sometimes, you know. And Elisha just comes over and he's going, Elisha, mate, look, what's happened? I, I was doing this, building a shelter, the axe head fell off in the water. I can't find it, but I bought it from a friend. He's going to be really upset with me. And Elisha goes, oh, mate, don't worry about it. <laughs> just chill out. And he throws a stick in the water, right? Again, what's such a random thing to do? What that... But like the guy's looking at him going, mate, what's that doing? Do you know what I mean? And, but yet then the axe head floats to the top. And, and so in that moment, he like obviously grabs it, secures it, and then I mean, quick, I'm sure quickly gives it back to the person he borrows it to. I love this story. It's a brilliant story. It's a wonderful illustration of how God is interested and cares about even the small and the trivial things in our lives. It reveals that he is El Roy, the God who sees me. The God who sees you. 
sometimes we think that God sees other people more, don't we? Oh, God, God clearly sees them. Look at what they're doing. Oh, God, God, God sees, sees that person, like they're, they're doing signs and wonders and miracles. God clearly sees that church because look what's happening there. But this story reminds us that God is our void, that he sees us, that he sees you, and he cares. I wonder if you have a testimony of how God has done something that to others seem weird and insignificant, but to you, it's a reminder that God is with you. I had one of these um, moments when I was setting up Kahila. Kahila is a church, for some of you who don't know, I was set up a church on Brick Lane, we meet Wednesday nights, um, and the idea was how do you do church for unchurched people, but we set it up in the form of a coffee shop. Um, but when we were setting it up, I was trying to like, how am I going to do this, need to raise money, and people were being like, no, it's not going to happen, it's too risky, don't try it. I even went to one church and said, hey, look, we want to work in partnership with you, and, and there, was, there was this one meeting that I had, and it was, they were just so negative, I just came away and go, maybe I am just being too random. Maybe it's like it's just too, you know, maybe I shouldn't do it. And so then I I got on the tube feeling all, um, you know, a bit down and thought maybe I should just not bother. And then I looked up and there was a guy sitting opposite me and on his neck he had this tattoo and it said, be the first, live your dreams. And I was like, like, that's a bit weird. And I'm like, God, is that you? Um, because like, obviously, like, <laughs> you know, but uh, I mean, it's not like you see that ad, that tattoo like everywhere. Um, and I always wanted to call Kahila before it, before it, the name Kahila came to fruition. I wanted to call it Life Cafe because at, at the time, that's what Christians like. There's only three names you can ever call a cafe: Life, Lighthouse, or Oasis. Okay, that's. If you don't call it any of them, you're not working in the spirit of the Lord. No, I'm teasing. But, but um, so it was word life. And so when I said, God, is that you? The, at that point, I kid you not, the guy leant forward and grabbed the handrail and tattooed on his hand, it had life. And I, and I just knew that that was God. And, and for others, that, like when I tell that story, that's, like, that's a bit random. But for me, it's what I needed as a confirmation that God was with me in this moment and this idea, this vision was God's and not my own. And, and all of a sudden, in that moment, all the, the negative stuff that I'd received or felt I was receiving um, went and I just knew that God was going to find a way. And as I say, that for me, I'm so grateful to God for that, that kind of that random moment that, that to, to some others may be insignificant. I'm sure many other people saw that tattoo on his neck or have seen that. T- I don't know, it may have just been an angel and, and, um, or whatever. But however it was, in that time, that's what I needed and God sent him to me. You know, they're all kind of small and, and, and kind of seemingly insignificant, but yet to the individuals, it's so significant. And so I love this. I love these stories. They illustrate how God uses our everyday circumstances to teach us about himself. And it reveals his providential purpose to work all things out for growth and for the good, if only we trust him and have the vision to see him at work. You know that God knows you intimately, right? Do you know that? That there's, there's no detail in our lives, no matter, no situation, no, no incident that's going on that escapes his loving and omniscient eyes. He, he declares this over us in Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. This is not just a, a, a kind of amount of information. Like we say, yeah, we, oh yeah, I know that. I know that scripture. You know. But it's, it's actually, it's a matter of a, an, an intimate knowing of God saying like, 
I know this about you because, because it's how much I love you. I know everything about you. It's the expression of the father's heart for his child. You see, I know my children. I, I know their rhythms. I know their behaviours. I know their, their reactions. I know the words that they speak. I know when they're not happy. I know when they're happy. I know what makes them happy. I know what makes them sad. I know when they're feeling tired and grumpy and how that's being worked out. I know where they're angry because they're hungry. I know, every, I know so much. About, yeah, of course, there's some things about them I don't know because I'm not the father. But I know things about them because I'm invested in them. Because I love them. And that's limited in comparison to the love that the father has. It goes, I know you. I know how you're feeling right now. I know the disappointment you're facing because of this. I know what's making you happy because of that. I know that you're struggling with guilt because of this. I know it all. And he still says, and I love you. And I want to deal with that. And I want to work with that. And I'm sorting that out. You don't need to worry about that. That's been resolved. I've got it all. But just know the relationship, the love that I have for you. He cares about us because he is El Roy, the one who sees you. So it's no matter what you're facing, he sees you and he cares and wants to use it to draw you to himself. He wants to use it to build your faith and to build your courage. to strengthen your faith and change lives. But you see, the problem is too often we pursue God as the rewarder or we pursue God as the fixer, not recognising that God himself is the reward. The relationship with God is a reward. How often sometimes do I pursue God with a certain agenda and of, you know, when I fast, it's because not because I just want to come close to God, but because I want God to fix something or resolve something. No, not, just to, not because I just want to come closer to Him. And He is gracious. In the miracle of the axe head, we are reminded again of how God is not only able to do super abundantly above all we can ever ask or imagine, no matter how small or how large the problem is. But we discover that he is available in his loving care to reach out to us in our time of need. This is not to suggest that he always removes the problem or the issue or the concern. But it does stress that he was always with us. That he never leaves us nor forsakes us. That he's always there to comfort us and give us strength to endure. So the miracle of the axe head at first may seem a bit random and perhaps insignificant, but to the individual it meant everything. It reveals a God who sees us and cares for us, who is gracious and merciful to act. It reveals a God who is relational and who can use the challenges and difficulties we face in life as an opportunity to bring us closer to him and to reveal part of himself to us. So folks, if you're feeling anxious this morning about something, if you're feeling tired and exhausted from trying to resolve some of the problems you are facing, then I believe that this morning's message is offering us an invitation. An invitation to trust him and to let go. An invitation to come and rest in his presence. For when you do, your hope will be restored. When you do, you will again gain new revelations as to who God is. And when you do, you will discover that God is faithful and can be trusted in every circumstance. We all go through those seasons, don't we? 
or you find ourselves doubting and questioning and, and feeling overwhelmed. I picked this song for us to kind of close out on. And it starts with, I lean not on my own understanding. And recognising that my life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. And then it goes into the course about, uh, we will climb this mountain with our hands wide open. The image of why we have our hands wide open is to show that we're not holding anything. You see, when, when I, 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 I did this illustration a few times now here, but like the idea of like when, we, when we're holding on to stuff, we can't receive what the Father wants to give. And particularly if our hands are closed, it means we're really clinging on. But we've come with hands wide open in order that the Father can take away that which is currently in our hands that he doesn't want us to have in order that he can place in our hands the things that we need to continue, right? And so as we sing this, I pray that it will be a posture in your heart to come so that you would not lean on your own understanding, that you would not lean on the current circumstances that you find yourself in. And I pray that in that moment that God will do something that to, to others may seem insignificant, but to you is significant. Because it reminds you that God cares. Amen? Let's pray. And uh, let's thank Sung Sung. Father, we thank you that you are Elroy, that you are the one who sees us. Father, I thank you that... Um, we need to hear that this morning and, and every morning, Lord. Lord, that you are just as concerned about us and, and the situations that we're in than you are anyone else. And Father, I thank you that when we look to you, you are gracious and compassionate and faithful enough to step in and move. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning, Lord. If, if there's things that they feel burdened or weighed down about this morning, Lord, I just pray that they will come with their hands wide open, ready to receive uh, a move of your Spirit to bring transformation, Lord. May we hear from you in this time of prayer and worship. Um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.